Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking about carbon and how it could disrupt the entire nature of the commodities sector. At the moment, only a small slice of emissions are covered by either compliance markets or voluntary offsets. There's little to no support for technologies and companies practicing carbon avoidance, not emitting the carbon in the first place. As carbon regulation develops over the next 20 years in response to climate change, this could drastically change the nature of the commodities sector, creating new asset classes and categories of commodities, for example, plant-based proteins or biopolymers into fabrics, changing the nature of plastics themselves. It could also supercharge the circular economy. What does this mean for the commodity trading community? It certainly means at the individual level, everyone will in some form or fashion become a carbon trader. It also means that there's incredible opportunity to invest in the circular economy and to start investing in technologies that would give rise to these new asset classes. Our guest is Eric Rubenstein. Eric has been a commodity trader for over 15 years in various commodity trading shops and also banks. And for the latter part of his career, he's been focusing in on the circular economy and carbon offsets. He's now launched and is the managing partner of New Climate Ventures, an early stage VC fund focused on carbon reduction and avoidance technologies. As always, you can support the show by leaving us a positive review on the platform you're listening on. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Eric, thanks for joining. Paul, thank you so much for having me. So in some ways, this story starts out quite small around some definitions and what's been done to date in the carbon markets. But as I hope we'll see on this journey, escalates to affect everyone and change possibly the entire nature of the current setup of commodities. So to start that journey, can you just frame up for us what has been done to date in carbon offsets, taxes, whatever we're talking about here? and how that's primarily around carbon reduction, as opposed to avoidance, and how that really represents quite a small slice of really carbon emissions. But can you just define for us the current state of the the various compliance and then the, the voluntary markets? Let me start with this then. So there's regulatory markets, and then there are voluntary markets in the in the carbon space today. That should continue for Sometime the expectation is is certainly um, years, but it could be longer than just a few years since the world is is figuring out right now how to define what offsets are, how to define how they fit into trading de- definition, um, and whether there's regulation that's that's tax or otherwise related rather than it being market specific related. So it's actually very complicated. And it's something that I'm not sure anyone has a full handle on the scope and what the forecast of what the future will be. Uh, And I certainly don't know the full scope and know what the, you know, have a, a crystal ball of what that's going to look like. But starting with the regulated market, there are Markets that are regulated specifically around, and they're all geographical, I should say. So California has a regulated market where fuels, for instance, uh, if you are replacing a fuel, so someone like Tesla, for instance, being that they're replacing what would be a gasoline powered vehicle with an electric power vehicle, which is less carbon emitting, uh, they have a marketplace there that they can sell what's effectively an offset into, and they can monetize that. Canada has a carbon tax, which is is a different mechanism. And other regions and other countries have different, uh, Europe has its own system, for instance, where there's a defined carbon mechanism for, for people to be able to buy and sell. And, and there are certain things that can fit into those buckets and certain things that can't. So if you're protecting, say, a forest, in a certain area, or that may qualify in some regions uh, and not others. And so there's a lot that, that is, is happening in the space. But the, the piece that I really focus on because of what I'm doing in, in my career now 
is the voluntary space where it's outside of all of these regulated markets to a large extent. It can fit into the regulated market in some instances, but in other instances, it's entirely outside of that scope. So it's a, it's a grayer area that is still being defined. And it's only been over the last number of years, say two to four years, where, where new offsets are actually being created, new categories of offsets within that space. Uh, and I expect that to continue for some time still. Hmm. And as I understand it, the vast majority outside of, say, some of these fuels, um, the LCFS, etc., the vast majority of whether it's the compliance market, the regulated market, or in particular, the voluntary market, are focused around carbon reduction, as opposed to avoidance. Can you just frame that up for us? Yeah, so you can think of carbon reduction as something that's taking carbon out of the air, hopefully permanently, but at a, at a minimum, semi-permanently. So the semi-permanence would be trees. If you're protecting a forest, that forest can still burn down that forest could still be cut down in the future. But if you're protecting it, then for some period of time, there's going to be some quantifiable amount of carbon that is removed from the atmosphere. Different trees have different, I guess, power to do so. And they're actually engineered trees now are, that can absorb even more carbon than companies creating those, for instance. But that's one form. Another form, which is technological and is, is where I spend more of my time thinking around, is carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere by some other mechanism other than a tree. So you could have a giant fan, for instance. So you could call this direct air capture. DAC is what people refer to it as today. So direct air capture, you have a giant fan that's pulling this, this carbon out of the air, and it can liquefy or solidify the carbon. So mineralize it, for instance, and that is a more permanent removal. So the thought being that if you take that carbon, you liquefy it and you inject it into the earth, it could be gone from the, or the world, from the atmosphere at least, for centuries, thousands of years, potentially. So there's this definition of a thousand plus year permanence that some people think around, behave around, and those are the technologies that that some people are very, very interested in. And that's the area of the market that I think is interesting. And it's not just giant fans. It can also be uh, seaweed. If you grew seaweed out in the middle of the ocean and kelp is, is what people are generally referring to that seaweed as. And you have this kelp that's in the middle of the ocean and it's growing and then you cut it and it's, and it's denser than the water and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, that's another form of a permanent removal is the expectation uh, that it will be permanent and it captures a quantifiable amount of carbon. Uh, and that's another carbon removal method. Uh, you could use algae, you could use other natural forms as well, but so long as it's removing it and, and getting it to a place where it's no longer existing uh, in the atmosphere, uh, that's the, the removal definition on the avoidance definition. It's if you create something that replaces that other thing that is emitting. So in the case of Tesla, it is a electric car that is replacing a more pollutant vehicle. And so it is an avoidance. You're avoiding the emissions associated with the old vehicle because that old vehicle is being replaced by a newer, less uh, emittive vehicle. So in that, in that circumstance, there's a whole world of things uh, when you start looking at it like that. So avoidance is really the thrust of this conversation, because to date, well, for the most part, as we've stated, a lot of the current um, projects that are awarded with op voluntary offsets or even regulatory uh, credits are to do with reduction. And avoidance, so that A, the real challenge that the world faces, you know, just thinking back to the discussion with Jonathan Goldberg on an earlier op uh, episode, is, you know, we can't afford to dig out more fossil carbon and have relatively inefficient ways of capturing that carbon. It's far better to avoid using that car, emitting that carbon in the first place. And with one or two very slim exceptions, for example, Tesla, which is tied to the fuel standards. Um, there's there's very little in the way of actually rewarding 
avoiding carbon and and i guess your argument and the and the opportunity here is that's an incredibly large world and opportunity set can you just define for us a bit further what you mean by avoidance and then give us some examples where that's happening today even without those rewards in place yeah and i guess also let's step back for one second because we're talking about carbon reduction as this removal from the world so the way that we're that i'm defining or thinking about reduction isn't avoidance, which is a reduction as well, it's this removal. So a lot of people actually refer to carbon removal, not carbon reduction. I'm using those interchangeably in the way that I'm speaking about it, which which may not be the the parlance of, of some. But on the avoidance side, it is a much bigger market. I mean, an avoidance is just not purchasing something or using something that is emittive. So in terms of, of avoidance, one way of not of avoiding emissions is not emitting in the first place by not producing something but the reality is we're we're all still using things and we have shown i think as a society that we're willing to buy things that we like to replace things that we also like but maybe are a little less good for the world or bad for the environment and again I, I think, uh, you know, I mentioned impossible and beyond. That's one example of there are people that will eat that instead of meat, even for one meal periodically, because it's it's good enough as a replacement in certain circumstances. And people are, are accepting of that because it's good. Things that are good, people will adopt. So on the avoidance side, uh, it's a huge universe because we're talking about avoiding emissions associated with construction. We're talking about avoiding emissions associated with uh, clothing that we wear, with things that we eat. So our day-to-day lives are really about to be disrupted, so to speak, by the addition of all these cool new products that are going to be available to us because people are innovating and creating things that are either cost competitive with the things we purchase today or only slightly more expensive or expensive to the point where we're willing to buy them. And that's exciting. The fact that we can have things like a bio leather, a plant-based leather, that we can have a shoe that is made from things that are more friendly to the earth or jeans even uh, that are more friendly to the earth. So all of these clothing items, hopefully one day will be far less emittive and companies are on board with, with adopting new technology into their product mixes. Uh, Recycled plastics is an easy one to point to where there are all these recycled plastics um, initiatives to include more recycled plastic, but then you can take that a step further and you can actually create plastic, new plastic out of t-shirts now. That's a technology that needs to scale and cost needs to be brought down, but it's another thing that just is, is brought into this mix of avoiding emissions in the world and it's something that's an opportunity for companies and people to get involved in. So at the moment, effectively, what you're saying is these products that have come to market are, of course, for the most part, more expensive than existing solutions using petrochemicals. However, they are gaining market share because of consumer choice, consumer preference to buy Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat, and etc., Plant Plus, where you know, it has an added benefit of being more environmentally friendly, or indeed electric cars, where for the most part, consumership of those are driven by choice and taste and the fact that it's much simpler not to have to go to the mechanic every couple of months to get an oil change. So so at the moment, we're relying on consumer preference. The the kind of the, the aha moment, at least in our discussions that we've had prior to this, is What were to happen if there were to be carbon avoidance uh, schemes that were rewarded, alternatively, the carbon taxed in those products that don't have that environmentally friendly footprint? Because that would presumably unlock not only the circular economy, but also the technological applications that are currently going into creating these alternative products to petrochemical based ones. Yeah. So the thought being that you can either penalize people for still using the things that they that are emittive. So I'll point to Europe where they have a law that was voted in a couple of years ago that goes into effect in 2025, 
for textile recycling, where there's penalties, uh, financial penalties, if you're not recycling the textiles. That's something that New York is looking at. New York City is looking at right now as well. A bill, I believe, has been introduced there that would do something similar if it got voted in. So that's one way is punishment. The other way is to reward people for doing good. And the reward mechanism can be a carbon offset in my mind, and it can be voluntary. And we are in a world today where companies are purchasing carbon offsets or they are investing in companies that are emissions avoiding um, as part of their plans to decarbonize in the future. And really that trend has only been over the last few years where companies are willing to do that and branch out beyond, say, just the voluntary forestry type assets that are offsets that are available. So I see a world where these avoidance offsets should exist. I see a world where these avoidance offsets will likely exist on a voluntary basis first in the next couple of years. And then beyond that, it becomes a question of how much they're adopted voluntarily, what gets voted in in different regions and legislatively to regulate those markets or create those markets, whether there are more tax penalties um, or otherwise for folks emitting that drive them to work with those markets and purchase those offsets, or if that means that they are pushed away from it because it's regulated out of their their mindset of what they should or should not be doing. And some of that will be geographically driven, where if you have to do something in your own geography, if the plant needs to be in your backyard or if the forest needs to be in your backyard uh, versus if it's across the world. And and in my mind there, it's, it's unfair to force people to decarbonize in their backyard when the atmosphere is global, just like commodities in a lot of situations are global commodities. Uh, Carbon is a global commodity too, in my mind. It's it's all over the earth, pretty much by definition. Um, so if you're reducing emissions in a different locale, you're still reducing emissions uh, or removing emissions or avoiding emissions. Getting some credit for that makes sense to me, but all these definitions still are up in the air. They still need to be defined, and it's going to be on a voluntary basis first. Uh, which will drive down the cost to make all of these different goods that are beneficial to decarbonizing the world, which people are going to enjoy. And then we'll be able to adopt more of it. And if you're accelerating the adoption of these different goods, uh, it's it's just better for the world if we're avoiding more and more emissions. So the faster we can avoid emissions, the better, just like the faster we can remove emissions, the better. So two questions. One is, what is the state at the moment with regards to um, thinking on this subject, the expansion of voluntary schemes and others, regulatory schemes, to include these avoidance type products and technologies? And, And secondly, where are we at on the technological side? I mean, is this still very nascent, hard to scale technologies? Or are we seeing in the case, you know, for example, of impossible, uh, you know, plant-based meats, these are quite well developed. I mean, where are we at in terms of using bio solutions for fabrics, for plastics, etc.? But uh, I don't like asking compound questions. So if you could ask the first one, answer the first one first. So on the, on the creation of regulation around avoidance or the creation of new offsets that are avoidance offsets using these new technologies, I'd say it's extremely nascent. There isn't really much beyond LCFS, so the California carbon standard where you can use fuels as avoidance. So electricity being a fuel that would be used as as avoidance. We've already discussed, but there's there's not much beyond that. And it's it's soil carbon that's been defined. So if you're not growing an animal and instead you are planting switchgrass, like it's an avoidance maybe of of the animal that would have been emitted otherwise, or if you are um, not cutting down a tree. But in terms of impossible or beyond, or just call it food tech qualifying, there's no regulation around that. In terms of a alternative material, also no regulation around that. And even in the voluntary markets, while these things have been brought up to registries, for instance, that would be bodies that can help bring these to fruition, uh, as far as I'm aware, nothing's been created yet. And 
that's a huge opportunity and it will get unlocked. And in terms of technologies that could qualify, it's, it's fairly broad. So you can, for instance, take proteins and you can grow those to make, so using synthetic biology, you can make fabrics. Like that's, that's technology that's nascent that, that's just being created now. But technologies that are, that are proven, you can take a agricultural byproduct and you can make that into fabric. And whether there's multiple ways of doing that, but there are early stage companies that have created prototypes for various different things using that sort of technology. And then there's also technologies where you're using uh, bacteria or yeast. So you can think bacterial or, or yeast uh, fermentation to, to also make materials that are biological in nature, but that when blended with uh, biopolymers can be completely biodegradable, can be formed in different ways to make replacements for leather, replacements for clothing, uh, replacements for packaging even. And, and those are technologies that, again, are, are nascent, but some of them are on market uh, using seaweed, for instance, to make a, a packaging material. I've seen technologies like that. We're invested in companies that are making bio leather or other bio fabrics. Um, there are companies that are making hair out of, out of plant-based materials. So it goes far beyond just making food out of bio-based materials where, yes, you can precision ferment even milk proteins to make milk without the cow. Yeah, and the argument is essentially all of these technologies are being developed uh, irrespective of a lack of um, supporting carbon regulation or offset capability. And were that to come in in the next decade, which seems eminently feasible as voluntary credits under the current sort of restrictions are going to start running out, or at least the, the number that can be, can be generated is going to slow because there's just fewer options to create those. This might be the next big push. This could drastically change and disrupt the nature of commodities as we know them today. Can you talk about what this would mean for your commodity trading desk? What types of new economies this would create? You know, the circular economy. What, what would it mean for commodities as we know it? Yeah. So there's, there's kind of two pieces there. One is the carbon offsets that we're talking about, these avoidance offsets, if they were created, which I believe they will be, they will accelerate these technologies, which is a positive thing because then we get more of it in the market. If you just look at electric vehicles, it's not 90% of market today. It's far less than that. And when you look at alternative meats, for instance, again, the amount of replacement that's already happened has been extremely small relative to the size of the protein markets overall. By having a mechanism for companies to find financing that is outside of traditional realms, so having these avoidance offsets would allow for companies to accelerate their growth and get into market faster. So then when we start talking about net neutrality in 2050, 2060, 2040, maybe we've got a better shot at that if we're accelerating the growth of companies that right now are, want cash and maybe aren't raising capital because they don't want to get, you know, founders don't want to get diluted or, or whatever the case might be. If they had another revenue stream, that's fantastic. So that's the one thing. On the other side, how does it disrupt commodity markets? Well, electricity markets are widely expected to be strained because of the way that we are adopting electric vehicles and the path that we expect to be. So we need to put a lot more power production in the market. In order to put that power production in a market, um, we want it to be renewable. And so we're trying as a society to scale renewable technologies. And that's just one market. Then you look at the food markets and there's soy proteins that's being used. There's pea proteins. So you're using agricultural product to, in order to replace these other foods that we were eating traditionally. Now, granted, cows are eating agricultural product as well and growing off of that. So, and, and you can precision ferment a lot of the proteins and things that we are anticipating being in these foods in the future. 
So there are ways to avoid straining the agricultural markets, but there's periods of time where, where that may happen uh, just while we're transitioning toward this new carbon economy. And that's just one example again. So as you keep moving further and further down, if you're using agricultural waste product, uh, there's going to be competition between fuels, as we've seen historically, um, with ethanol, let's say ethanol with, goes into gasoline, 10% of gasoline in the US, plus or minus. So the ethanol market is highly tied to the gasoline market because of, of that linkage. So as we move away from gasoline toward electricity, the ethanol market's also going to get weaker and it's going to need to find a home. And so maybe it's finding its home, other sorts of biofuels, or maybe it's finding its home by creating new products out of it. Um, you can actually make jet fuel and diesel fuel out of ethanol. You can make plastics out of ethanol. That may be another way of having a greener commodity in the end by using a different feedstock. You don't have to use the oil necessarily. You could use the ethanol as the input. So maybe that's part of how this transition happens, uh, where ethanol should get weak in the future as electricity starts to be used more and more in vehicle fleets. But maybe it doesn't because maybe it gets repurposed into something else or finds a home somewhere else. Or maybe the corn husks are being used in, for fuels. Uh, you can make biofuels out of, out of agricultural waste. And then that's going to compete with the production of new alternative materials as well, like a a textile. So as we're looking at these different commodities, one of the initial things I think is strain on the market where you're running out of agricultural byproduct because everyone's trying to use it either as a fuel, as an input into another process to make chemical or as an input into a process to make a textile or something that is a plastics replacement. There's a lot of different ways that, that this can be done. And it's just fascinating as, as we're watching it play out. Mm, and that's part of that. The two big themes that strike me from this discussion is one is energy transition. Carbon is leading to a decommodifying of commodities, right? It's going to be, you, you mentioned the agri markets, you know, it's going to be what's the protein content of that particular plant as a, you know, its constituent contents as opposed to just pricing it as a soybean. And that would be true of all commodities as we start to dig into their attributes and provenance as it relates to sustainability. The other is, and we're already seeing trading houses step into this space in anticipation, is, is obviously the circular economy, which would get an incredible boost if the expansion of carbon regulation offsets and credits and so forth really starts to open up to that world as well. Can you talk about the circular economy and what that would mean for the commodity traders themselves and what they'd be trading and what markets they're in? Yeah, I love the circular economy. The circular economy is when you're taking something that's, call it a natural or a byproduct of another process, and so a waste product, and you're using it to create something is itself replacing something else pretty much, or that can be fit back into the economy in a natural way that, that we know it. So just to give a couple examples, circular economy would be you're taking a recycled product and you're making a new product out of it, and then you're recycling that new product as well. So a plastic bottle, you're recycling that plastic bottle, and then it creates a new plastic bottle, and then you're recycling that plastic bottle again. Um, the emissions associated with that, just to speak a, at it from an emission standpoint, is less than producing a new thing, and even less if you're using chemical or, or biological processes, at scale at least, to recycle that product, where you're breaking it down into monomers, so individual components, and then building it back into polymers, which is an, you can do in an infinite loop. The plastic itself is spent, so it can't be used again after somewhere between two and six recyclings, if you're doing it in a traditional mechanical method, but it's an infinite loop if you're breaking the, the bonds and building them back up again. So that's one example. Uh, another example would be taking an agricultural waste product and turning that into, let's say, a textile and then recycling the textile. So again, that's a circular loop. Another example would be if you're taking carbon dioxide and you're turning that into something else. So you can turn CO2, for instance, into a diesel or a jet fuel. And then let's say that jet fuel that's going into the airplane is 
and then the plane is emitting the same amount of carbon dioxide as you're taking into the process to create the jet fuel. I mean, that's a circular process at that point where you're taking the carbon, you're creating something out of it, and then you're capturing it again, and, and it, it becomes this infinite loop, even if it's not in the exact same location. So those are all examples of, of the circular economy. And that, I think it's very important to understand that these things are possible. And at scale, they can be hugely beneficial for the world. What might be interesting is that one day when it's at scale, when we're running out of carbon dioxide, and that's something we don't need to think about for a very, very long time. <laughs> but that's something that, that could be a reality in the future. So when we start talking about how this could disrupt markets, the first stage is there's too much carbon dioxide in the air and, or you know, emissions, and we're capturing those emissions, and we're making things out of them, and, and there's a cost to sucking it out of the air or, or taking it off of a, a plant that's emitting. And, and that's being recycled into something else. But in the future, if we have too many technologies and if this is too popular, uh, you could actually you know, decarbonize too much and all of a sudden you're taking too much carbon dioxide of the air. I have no idea what the science is behind that and what the repercussions would be. That sounds like a problem yeah. for the next generation. But that's a great problem to have. And if we get there, like let, let's hope <laughs> we get there. Let's plan to get there. And let's actually make that happen because I'd rather be talking about carbon markets in that perspective where we're, we're talking about the other side of, of where we can be in the future. And we're, we're not there yet. But yeah, let's let's get there. And the competition is real between these different the use cases. And I, and I just really want to nail this. So at the moment, if you're a, a trading house in metals, you might, and they, many of them have, you know, you're, you're focused on recycling. There's commercial opportunities there, just simply as a function of price with rising prices in steel, aluminum, etc. And that market's always existed. But at the moment, that's not powered by a recognition of the carbon reductions or avoidance um, inherent in the idea of reusing materials. Were that to come in, that could entirely change the nature of, say, metals. Oh, for sure. So I'll give an example there. There are different technologies now that, for recycling lithium. And if lithium could be recycled, then you don't have to mine as much lithium. And uh, you know, th that's not anticipated to be the case for a long time. But the growth of lithium mining, let's say, would reduce if we could recycle the lithium or if we could find a, a way to synthetically make it, let's say, or if we could create a battery that doesn't even use metals in it and uses, uh, we saw a technology that, that uses potassium, uh, for instance, and that's something that if you're avoiding the use of the metals to begin with, it's disruptive to the metals markets. I have to anticipate that at some point, we're going to find some technology. We're going to create some technology that avoids the use of metals for these different purposes. But yeah, I mean, that, that's one way that it can be disrupt. Or on the emissions side, if there's a tax on emissions associated with mining, let's say, in globally or in certain jurisdictions, then that also would create a, I guess, a different price at which people would need to trade metals in order to balance that market again to account for those taxes or those, you know, those different regulations that go into place. So yeah, there's definitely room for commodity markets specifically, whether it's a metals market in that way, or whether it's a fuels market, if there was a tax on jet fuel, let's say, uh, that made jet fuel significantly more ex expensive globally, then it's going to pass through the consumer. And maybe that means the consumer's flying less, which in turn means less jet fuel that's being used, which in turn means refineries need to behave differently. And there's just so many different ways that the world can deal with these problems around emissions that it's not necessarily doing yet. And we got to anticipate that different things are going to happen and we don't know what they're going to be yet. We can help shape those things, I think, by voluntarily opting in to shaping the markets and I think that's where things get interesting. If we're proactive as a global community, as individual companies, as individual uh, sectors in shaping the solutions uh, voluntarily. And, and so long as it's good for the environment, then maybe there won't be as much regulation. And maybe we can create a world where we're not regulating out of this. Uh, maybe we are all opting into making a cleaner future. And I mean, the way this has been developing, it's been a consumer driven trend that has been adopted by corporations. And now the corporations are influencing the behavior. 
even more so, I, I think, than the regulations themselves, because regulations are lagging at this point behind the developments and um, the voluntary behaviors. So, yeah, we're going to disrupt commodity markets in a number of different ways just by the way that we're treating this. And I guess I'll point to one more thing before I before I pause. You can see it very clearly in Europe as well uh, with the carbon markets and the gas markets and the coal markets all being very linked in the way that they've been trading the last couple of years. And that's, I think, what we need to anticipate in the future is it doesn't just have to be these energy markets that are linked in that way. It can be many markets. And I think you do see it in the ag markets with, say, soybeans between renewable diesel and and possibly even with these new foods, uh, these alternative meats, like all of this, I think it's linked together and the carbon associated with it, I think will end up getting linked into these into these behaviors and into these different markets as well. But the essential point is at the moment is that regulation and voluntary markets lag behind the need and also the new developments that are being made on carbon avoidance. And if you were a trading house today, you could see a substantial model whereby you're investing in the circular economy and with the expectation that at some point in the next five, 10 years, new taxes are going to come in or new voluntary offsets or regular or compliance offsets are going to come in, whereby that facility, that capability, those products are worth significantly more because they inherently are avoiding carbon rather than producing brand new metals. So that's a fair statement. Yes. And I guess I'll point out that it's an opportunity for companies to get ahead of the curve. So th there's oil companies, for instance, that are specifically investing in carbon reduction, carbon removal technologies. And I'll point to one, Occidental Petroleum is doing a fantastic job of working toward this future where they aren't even calling themselves an energy company like others are doing. They're calling themselves the future of what they're going to be, at least a carbon company where they're going to be, they're going to be producing more carbon removal. So removing more carbon than they're producing from the oil operations. And that's just amazing that they're, they had this foresight and they're, this is going back five years, maybe even more than that, where they have been moving toward this. And so they were way ahead of the curve. And I think in the same way, there's going to be others ahead of the curve transitioning business models where the carbon becomes the focus and they're going to benefit from that because the carbon is going to end up being the driver of what these other markets are doing. Uh, and so if you're, if you're in that market, then you're going to have a pole position on, on participating. Which is fascinating, right? Because the logical conclusion of this discussion of what you've just said is that every commodity trader and every commodity trading house will effectively become in some form or fashion a carbon trading business fundamentally whether you're an ag trader a metals trader or an energy trader a big part of your day a big part of your book a big part of your company is going to be focusing in on the carbon intensity or however it might play out of the products you're trading and the world is going to get a lot more complex in the number of commodities that are, are out there because again like we said earlier it's going to be more about attributes as well so there's a tremendous upside here it's obviously risky because there isn't like the regulatory support today there's only really consumer preference and who knows in a world of a commodity super cycle the volatility that we're experiencing on the geopolitical scene some of these things might end up being pushed down the chain of, of urgent and important but it seems like all of our the commodity trading community will in, in 10 years time ultimately be carbon traders as opposed to an energy trader a metals trader etc i think you can characterize it that way and i guess it's very similar to in energy markets for instance where if you're trading power you're kind of trading the underlying as well you have to understand what's happening in coal and gas and oil in order to know depending on where you are uh, in the world how that power market's going to behave. Or if you're in the oil market, you have to understand the way chemical markets and gas markets are behaving because it's going to influence your market as well. And that inner connection is going to start to include carbon in a bigger and bigger way where it 
becomes something that intrinsically you have to pay attention to. And it's going to, I think, be the voluntary markets that are drivers of that because the voluntary markets even today are 90% of the offset markets, roughly. So when you're talking about there being a shortage of offsets, even in the next, I mean, right now, but also over the next number of years, and then the need for more offsets that can't be generated fast enough by protecting forests, let's say, you're going to need to create these other categories. And these different categories are going to have different values associated with them. And different regions are going to have different values associated with them. So you're talking about a global market that's developing uh, and evolving just like any commodity market has in its history. But this one is even more global in nature than most because it's in the air and the air is by nature global. And I guess that's the wrapping it up, the premise of New Climate Ventures as well. Your fund focusing on investing an early stage all of these technologies that are, for the most part, surrounding avoidance, but also reduction. Because in the world we've described, those are currently fundamentally undervalued. I believe so. As we move to a world where these technologies are being adopted more by us, by the consumer, it'll become a lot more visible to people as to what is happening and how these changes are happening. But in the venture world, we're investing in companies that are very early and industries that are very young. So I think we're at the very early innings of this whole transition. And by being at the early innings of the transition, I think that people involved now will benefit. One thing that we talk about fairly often because we get asked it very often is, is why now? Why is, why is now different than other times in history where we've thought that this energy transition is happening. I think it's entirely to do with the consumer driven trend that has, I don't even know if I want to call it a trickle anymore, but that is being strongly adopted by corporations and the corporations are behaving on the back of the, what's effectively being asked of them by the consumer because the consumer is rewarding them or said differently the corporations are making decisions that are just going to benefit the world. And then it's trickling down from there. I'll use BlackRock as an example where uh, they're asking the companies they're invested in to set sustainability goals and to have accounting associated with that so that they can quantify the emissions associated with what they're doing, which then brings into the whole equation, companies asking other companies to behave better, which has more of a trickle down effect. So it's not a government-led, government-subsidized initiative. It really is an initiative that's coming from the ground up. And then the top down, the government on down, is supporting that and helping accelerate it through initiatives. So yes, and we're investing in, in early stage technologies uh, that are carbon reduction, carbon removal, and avoidance technologies. And we're excited about what the future comes to bring here. Well, yes, it's been a it's been an interesting discussion, and I think one that, uh, like we said at the very start, sort of starts small but has momentous consequences. And I'm sure it's across the the commodity trading world, you know, as individuals needing to get more familiar with carbon itself and the regulations around it, because that will become a fundamental basis of, of their commodity they're trading, but also their organisations thinking about what a an empowered circular economy would look like and what uh, many of these alternative products would look like to the existing suite of petrochemicals or whatever it might be. So, so thanks, Eric, for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.